Well, welcome back, and we're down to those last six facts of our 18 that we've been looking at, and we're going to continue to explore them and then relate them back to the CNSS security model. So the first one that we're going to look at is this idea of a worm. And actually, we got a whole bunch of worms uh, listed here, uh, starting with that oldie but a goodie, the Morris worm, really the first one, probably, what, 87 lines of code, something like that, awfully a uh, program less than 100 lines of code. And uh, what it did is it went out and uh, it had a flaw in, in the code and it replicated uh, so that it was destroying all availability in terms of compute capability, storage capability, and eventually network capability. Very interesting, the uh, student or the, uh, the person, Robert Morris, who, who created it, his dad worked for the, uh, what, NSA, and uh, uh, he was a student at the time. He ended up getting five years probation and a uh, $10,000 fine and went on to a, uh, a good career in security. Uh, the other thing that was interesting about this is uh, he effectively took down the internet. He took down uh, at least a third of it at the time. Now, the internet in 1988 what, was not as big as it was today, but uh, that initial worm uh, replicated so wildly uh, that it was very effective at taking things down uh, before they were brought back up. And again, you've got these other attacks uh, out there. Again, these are, are, are worms that create copies of themselves. Those copies uh, spread, and uh, that allows them to take over uh, machines. Uh, in the, the case of the worms uh, mentioned before, they can be attacks against storage processing or transmission. Morris worm definitely was. Um, Typically, you want to have technology that captures and uh, uh, protects you against worms. Worms are similar to viruses. You can identify uh, signatures associated with them and block them. Um, they can affect confidentiality, integrity, or availability. Often, they affect availability. Uh, not always. Uh, again, the, it's a pretty thin line between what a worm is and what a virus uh, is. Worms are self-replicating viruses. Uh, typically, there's some user action uh, involved, but again, it's a pretty thin line. Trojan horse, we've already talked about a little bit before, but uh, uh, it, it's this uh, uh, ability to pretend to be something useful uh, when, in fact, it's not useful at all. It's actually a uh, mask uh, for an attack, and typically, it's looped in so that that Trojan horse, that program that you think is useful, is installing software that creates a backdoor. A backdoor we're going to talk about in a minute, but it's a mechanism to bypass the security and log into a, a particular system. So again, when you look at a, um, a Trojan horse, they can be identified by technology, but often it's education, making sure you're downloading software from reputable sites or downloading it after it's been verified. Uh, those Trojan horses can attack confidentiality, integrity, or availability. Typically, it's the confidentiality an integrity uh, component. It, it's typically a processing-based attack, but you gotta kinda click on something to go along. All right, we're gonna combine the uh, next two. It used to be a big debate, not so much anymore, uh, but this idea of a cracker and a hacker. Um, and so uh, cracking was going out there and trying to break into passwords, and then hacker is someone out there that uh, is the uh, uh, jargon Wikipedia uh, is out there trying to learn the detailed uh, mechanisms of programming systems and uh, applications. Um, so it's a, a, a thin line between a hacker and a cracker. Uh, both of them uh, 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 take upbridge uh, over you using the term incorrectly. But uh, 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 again, uh, crackers are out there trying to break the security. Hackers are trying to learn about it, uh, but they could uh, use it. All right, that brings us to a uh, backdoor. Backdoors are a mechanism that allows full access uh, in. Lots of ways of doing this. Trojan horse is one we just talked about. Um, we, the university I work at, we, we uh, had a programmer that established a backdoor where via email, uh, they were getting system statistics so that they could go in and troubleshoot and debug. Uh, the problem is they never changed the code and it continued to work about five years after the uh, programmer had retired, his email was still uh, logging all of this debugging information and he had a mechanism to get back in. 
He never exploited it. Uh, but those are things that you want to catch uh, using policy, making sure um, that uh, that type of coding does not occur where you allow someone to bypass your defenses and get uh, directly back in. And then finally, uh, just like social engineering, buffer overflow is uh, one of these devastating uh, attacks where you've got storage uh, uh, associated with a particular variable and um, the uh, uh, attackers can come in, overwhelm that resource, then they have a specially uh, constructed command that allows them to take control of the uh, system. And so, because it typically uh, defaults back when the memory is exhausted to a system prop. Uh, and depending on what the program was running at depends on what permissions that program uh, has when it defaults back to a system prop. So again, Backdoor is one of these things that drive people crazy, uh, but that backdoor, or I'm sorry, not backdoor, but buffer overflow, it's one of the things that drive people crazy, but it really is about uh, education and policy. You have to program your code in such a way that such a trivial attack doesn't work, but that also means you've got to protect all those variables uh, against this and have some simple checks in there to make sure um, that it's truncated and the additional uh, characters are thrown away or, or, or bits, bytes are thrown away or that uh, uh, you've got other mechanisms in place to protect you. Well, look at that. We've done this video in, in record time, especially compared to the first two videos, and we've talked through another six types of attacks. A worm, very similar to a virus. Trojan horse, a program pretending to be uh, something good when in fact it's attacking your system. Uh, the nuance difference between a cracker and a hacker, cracker trying to uh, circumvent security, a hacker trying to explore the beauty of it, uh, the programming details of applications, uh, a back door, the mechanism to circumvent security and come back in uh, bypassing uh, security, uh, delivered by lots and lots of different mechanisms, and then finally a buffer overflow, this idea that I'm just going to come in and uh, 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 get around your program by overflowing one one variable that's running at elevated status, and then that gives me control of the, the machine if I know what I'm doing. All right, and we've kind of, as we've gone through this, talked about planning for each of these attacks. It's not meant to be exhaustive. I haven't uh, talked about all sorts of uh, uh, interesting attacks, but this should give you a feel and give you a, a sense of the power of the CNSS uh, model and the uh, use of that model. Uh, to diagnose and to respond effectively to different types of attacks. Well, very good. What we're going to do uh, for the remainder of the video is not much. We're just going to introduce the next video, which is going to go in and talk about security planning. Uh, we're going to talk about security implementation, uh, talk about uh, strategic planning, and then uh, start moving into some other components associated uh, with chapter two in the book. So keep on studying, keep on learning, and look forward to seeing you in the next video. And between then, let's plan for these different types of attacks and a couple that I don't even have uh, listed here. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.